Murder is the ultimate crime and holds an endless fascination. In this programme, we're going to look back at the case of the elusive man in the trilby with the help of a 21st century jury of experts, psychologist and profiling expert Kerry Danes, journalist and crime novelist Hilary Bonner, retired senior police investigator Mick Turner and forensic scientist Alan Baker. What was the method? What was the motive? How was the investigation conducted? Were clues missed or deliberately ignored? Today, we ask who was the man in the trilby? And did he live or die? Great War veteran George Black was not the tallest of men, but as cashier at this local branch of Lloyd's in Bristol, he took no nonsense from anyone. Where Mr. Black was on duty, no customer ever jumped the queue. One Friday afternoon in January 1949, the worst happened. A smartly dressed young man pointed a gun, shouting, stick him up. Mr. Black resisted and paid with his life. The hunt was on for the killer in the trill we had. Born in Newport, Wales in 1897 and privately educated, George Baron Black was a bank employee of the old school. Serving in the First World War with the 6th Battalion Gloucester Regiment, he was a small but tough man. He told his wife that if he was ever attacked at work, he would fight back. Local people near the branch of Lloyd's in the Bristol suburb of Knoll knew Mr. Black as a man who went about his duties with military precision. He was always keen on his customers being served in the right order, said the vicar of the nearby St. Barnabas Church, the Reverend J.R.M. Johnson. As a regular user of the bank in Broadwalk, near the corner with Wells Road, the clergyman was one of the last people to see George Black alive. At around two o'clock, one hour before closing, on Friday, January the 7th, 1949, a young bespectacled man in a dark overcoat and wearing a green or grey trilby wandered into the bank and told the cashier that he needed to wait to meet a bookmaker called Murray. As the clock swept round towards three o'clock, Mr Murray had still not appeared and the bank was due to close within the next few minutes. The vicar and a lady from the draper's shop two doors away were waiting to be served. The vicar was to say later, the young man just took no notice whatsoever and just stared out of the window. I didn't pay any more attention to him and did not have the slightest suspicion that anything was wrong. The final customer of the day was John Rowe, a greyhound trainer at Knowles Stadium. The stranger, meanwhile, had told Mr. Black that as Mr. Murray had not appeared, he would leave him a note. The young man wrote a message on the back of a paying in slip. See you Monday at two. Missed you today, Joe. Waited until 3 p.m. But he still did not leave the bank. The moment the last customer, John Rowe, had bade his farewells, the man in the trilby went to the door, locked it, and then swung round brandishing a revolver. This is a stick-up, he shouted, like a character from some fifth-rate gangster movie. But this was not from the world of make-believe, and George Black knew it. The cashier made as if to resist, but as he moved, the gunman fired three times. A young banking assistant, Donald Twitt, watched terrified as George Black fell back dying. Straight away, the gunman bundled the 18-year-old into a cloakroom and plunged his hands into a till to grab 1,444 pounds, a sum worth more than 25,000 at today's values. Calmly locking the door behind him, the man in the trilby met his only serious resistance. From outside in the street, John Rowe had heard the shots and dashed to a nearby telephone box to call the police before heading back towards the bank. As the gunman moved towards his getaway car, John Rowe ran across to challenge him. You're in a bit of a hurry, Rowe shouted. I am, said the man. I've just collected a debt. 
Still more courageously, John Rowe jumped onto the running board, saying, you'd better wait a minute. The gunman responded by punching Mr. Rowe in the face. Leaving the heroic bystander staggering, the gunman opened the throttle and roared off down the Wells Road. By early Friday evening, a nationwide murder hunt was underway. Police began fingerprinting everyone who'd used the bank on that Friday afternoon. This crime happened just after the end of the Second World War. There will still have been many troops returning from conflict zones. And it's true to say that after any major war, illegal firearms are much more readily available. We can't escape the situation that ready availability of firearms leads to much more serious crime. Uh, Post-war Britain certainly did not turn out to be a land fit for heroes. And a lot of people had their ideals turned completely upside down. Uh, I remember my father, he went to war as a, a good Church of England boy, brought up in a small village, went to church every day. He believed in, in God and he believed in government. He came home believing in none of that. And I think an awful lot of people learned to believe only in their own survival after the war. As forces all over the country swapped information on known robbery suspects, the Austin car registered JHY812 was found abandoned one and a half miles away in Bristol's Totterdown district. Bristol's CID said the bullets were fired from a 32 caliber revolver or automatic pistol. One hit Mr. Black in the chest and killed him almost instantly. But there was no sign of a weapon. An automatic pistol would have discharged its shells, but nothing seemed to have been ejected onto the floor, unless the man had been meticulous enough to pick them up before escaping. The police actions when they first arrived at the scene of this crime would be absolutely critical to solving it. We would call this today the golden hour. Did the offender really collect three discarded cartridge shells? Or maybe another explanation is, did the police fail to find them? But in this particular case, the advantage from a scientific point of view was that the scene was pretty well protected. So fingerprints are a possibility, but obviously in a public environment, the potential is there are many thousands of fingerprints. Fortuitously, the robber had left behind a sample of his handwriting, badly written and carelessly blotted. The paying in slip with a message to Mr. Murray was found discarded on the floor of the bank. Newspapers competed with each other to analyse the inky scrawl in order to gain some insight into the mind of a killer. But I think in today's modern forensic perspective, the interpretation of character from handwriting is a bit of a no-no. Um, but I'm particularly concerned uh, when the, the comment is made that this person has a grudge against life and capable of bursts of violence. Um, which I would defy any scientist to be able to determine from somebody's handwriting. Police distributed hundreds of photographed copies of the paying in slip around the UK, hoping that someone would recognise the handwriting. Nowadays, this could be done, of course, almost instantaneously using the internet and using the media. But way back in 1949, they would have had to be distributed manually and perhaps posted in public places. In the three days that followed, more than 10,000 posters were issued throughout Britain. The public were told of a man aged around 26, five foot six or seven inches tall, pale and with a round face and wearing horn-rimmed glasses. Police and media began forming a more rounded view of the mysterious man in the trilby. The press painted a picture of a Jekyll and Hyde character with the mind of a ruthless clinical killer but with the ability to hide within a life of respectability. The idea that this person displayed a, a Jekyll and Hyde aspect to his personality seems but ludicrous. What's it based on? It's based on the view that people thought it was rather strange, apparently, that he didn't look like a killer. What is somebody meant to look like exactly? I would imagine that somebody who's going to commit um, a robbery would want to draw as little attention to themselves as possible. But this is it. In the minds of um, the general public, a criminal should look as vastly different to ourselves as possible. So maybe they expected him to have a white, black and white striped shirt and a swag bag. The newspapers struggled to understand how an experienced criminal, swag bag or no, would deliberately steal a car in broad daylight 
drive round Bristol in it for more than two hours, passing the bomb site from where he'd taken it, and then leave it outside the bank which he intended to hold up. The man must have realized that the loss would be discovered with the attendant risk of arrest for being in possession of a stolen car. Another puzzling feature, the newspaper said. And the man stayed in the bank for an hour before committing the crime, thus enhancing his chances of being recognized later. Are we looking here for an experienced criminal or a novice? On the one hand, there doesn't seem any need to wait in the bank for an hour before committing the crime, and why shoot the cashier? Why increase the public and police attention? But on the other hand, he's got the capability to steal a car and he's also got the availability of a firearm. So was the man in the trilby a professional or an amateur? Would he strike again? During the following weeks, the investigation would tragically provide an answer to at least one of those questions. The search to find the man in the trilby spread all over the country. Detectives established that after getting rid of the car, the gunman waited for a bus to Bath and then took a train to the Gloucestershire town of Yate. Witnesses apparently spotted the man at Yate station in an agitated state. Here, he boarded a train to Birmingham North and went to Earth. A succession of leads were followed up and abandoned. Police in Cornwall became involved when a grocer in Bodmin said a man answering the killer's description had tried to cash a false cheque, but the inquiries proved fruitless. Someone else thought they recognised the killer in a pub in Birmingham, but it turned out it wasn't him. The trail seemed to have gone cold. The investigators would have been desperate to bring the crime back into the public eye. To do this, they were going to need something new. This was an instance where perhaps the bank themselves could help. Lloyd's Bank offered a reward of £1,000 for information leading to the arrest of the killer. Frustratingly for the police, the case began attracting less and less publicity as media interest waned. Some types of offences are inevitably going to draw a huge amount of media interest and that can really be a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it might generate a huge amount of information as people think, oh, well, I know something that might be relevant and, and pick up the phone or make contact with the police. But the difficulty is the amount of pressure that this puts on an investigating team to sift through and actually investigate all the leads, which may very well be totally irrelevant. The inquiry desperately needed fresh momentum. And in the autumn of that year, fresh momentum came but under the most tragic of circumstances. On September the 13th that year, the manager of the Midland Bank at Alston near Penrith, in what was then Cumberland, was gunned down by a man described as tall and dark with a sallow complexion who escaped driving a black taxi. Then some 40 miles to the east of Alston, near Stanhope, police found the battered body of a taxi driver lying buried under stones in a ditch and shot through the head. Closer to Penrith at Melmaby, police found the body of the bank robber in the taxi. There's the use of a stolen car, there's the fact that banks were the target and that somebody was shot to death. The big question for the investigators is, are these two very violent crimes linked? However, it's perilous for investigators to link crimes together without some definitive evidence. For example, a fingerprint, which would have been available at the time, being present at both scenes. The dead man was quickly named as 24-year-old ex-army officer Charles Corbett Kennedy. In a sensational chapter of events, police inquiries revealed that the taxi had been hired by Kennedy to drive west from Durham to Alston. At Stanhope, the killer shot the driver, disposed of the body, and drove the taxi to Alston, where he tried to rob the bank. Using the taxi as a getaway car, he drove towards Penrith, but when he realized that the police had set up a roadblock, they believed that he shot himself, though oddly, no gun was found at the scene. Suddenly, police in Bristol sensed a major breakthrough in their nine-month hunt for the killer of George Black. But could the weapons used link the crimes and the perpetrators? 
There are two issues with the discharge of firearms, is the residue that's formed, the chemical residue that's formed as the, the, as the firearm is discharged, and there are certain chemical components that come out of the firearm which are deposited on people's clothing or hands, etc. In fact, in a more modern day context, uh, in the murder of Jill Dando, uh, the individual convicted of that crime, the firearm discharge residue was very significant evidence in that case, but there are a very limited number of particles found on the individual. Scotland Yard examined the ex-soldier's handwriting to see if it matched the scrawled note in Bristol. At the same time, in a bizarre development, detectives contacted only the three men who had witnessed the first robbery in Bristol, John Rowe, the vicar, and the young Donald Twitt, and took them on an overnight ride to Penrith to view Kennedy's body. But the three witnesses who traveled north were all sworn to secrecy about what they'd seen. Why? I've never known witnesses to be shown a dead body for the purpose of trying to identify someone. And as a procedure, I think it's pretty flawed, bearing in mind the traumatic experience these people have already gone through. And again, if the police are saying the case is over, that the offender is dead, why the need to swear the witnesses to secrecy? Eyewitness testimony is subject to all kinds of distortions and variations as perhaps you would expect. Each person tends to view uh, situations in slightly different ways. So if I were going to link a series of offences together, I would be looking for much stronger information, much more reliable information than simply eyewitness descriptions of the possible perpetrator. For reasons that have never been made public, the police did not feel able to close their file on the case. One explanation might be that even if the three Bristol men had given positive identifications, the police would still have had to establish beyond reasonable doubt that Kennedy was in the Bristol area in the crucial month of January 1949. And when they couldn't, the trail ran cold. It didn't help that five pound notes from the numbered haul of 1,444 pounds kept turning up. Two banknotes came to light within days of each other as far apart as Liverpool and London in April 1950. Still, fresh leads kept emerging from around the world. In 1955, the deputy head of Bristol CID, Inspector Jesse Payne, flew out to Italy to interview a red-headed Australian seaman who'd been sought continuously by Interpol since the day George Black was gunned down. The 33-year-old man had been a suspect from the start. A familiar face in local pubs frequented by seamen, he'd left Bristol soon after the murder. He was spotted in France, but then he vanished. It was now a worldwide hunt, and promising leads were followed as far away as Australia. And then, in December 1955, success came, when Italian police arrested the seamen in the Mediterranean port of La Spezia. Inspector Payne grilled the seaman for five and a half hours before shaking him by the hand and asking the Italian police to release him. The sailor not only insisted he knew nothing of the murder, but produced a cast iron reason for his disappearance. So it was another false alarm. The Trilby case was still unsolved. Loose ends and unsolved crimes, I think, make us feel quite anxious. It's something that's left unanswered, it's quite messy, and so we're going to look for anything that we can to try and clear things up. We hope that there will be a deathbed confession, that somebody will feel the need to purge themselves, but that really doesn't happen very often. People don't feel the need to confess because it's much easier for them to remain in a state of denial. They might know themselves that they've done it, but why should they say it out loud? If you say it out loud, it makes it more real. People write stories for themselves and they like to be the hero in the story. They don't like to admit to things which are, you know, unsavoury and nasty. So there isn't a need to confess. Nowadays, people who've committed a serious crime can never say they've got away with it. Even though I'm a retired officer, part of my work now is working with police forces to look again at unresolved cases. There might be new scientific opportunities, important witnesses might have changed allegiance. In any event, the cases are never closed. To this day, the case of the Noel Bank murder remains open. Was Corbett the robber? 
Could more have been done to find the killer and ascertain if the robberies were carried out by the same man? The outcome of this case is a little strange given the fact that there was a wealth of forensic information available, whether it be gunshot residue, bullets, fibres at the time. Um, if clothing items or samples had been taken from the bank or indeed the car and preserved, then they would have been evidentially very, very useful. Uh, but the reality now of going back and looking at old information that hasn't been preserved, then I think the reality is it will be very unhelpful. The Bristol bank robber could have been an ordinary man driven to an extraordinary deed in extraordinary times, somebody who never committed a crime again. On the other hand, he could have been Charles Kennedy. I base all of my novels on real-life crimes. If I were trying to put this story into a crime novel, I would look to find a link between the two crimes. I would be looking, in fact, to prove that the Bristol Bank robber was Charles Kennedy. But the police were unable to prove that, and that is why the case remained open, and in fact, I have an open mind on it. There are a lot of unanswered questions here. If Charles Kennedy is the man who committed both crimes, then why didn't the police find a gun at the scene of his death? They should have been able to tell if the same gun fired the fatal bullets in both cases. That should have been easy to ascertain. Why couldn't they put Charles Kennedy in the Bristol area? Why was there no trace of him there? And last of all, if he was the man responsible, why did the police feel the need to travel halfway across Europe to interview another suspect? I'm a long way from being convinced that Charles Kennedy is the man responsible for both these murders. The bank's reward of £1,000 remains unclaimed. It would now be worth at least 19000 A badly scrawled message to a non-existent friend remains the only tangible link with the man in the Trilby. Unless someone out there knows who he was. <laughs>